by asking you about one word. And that word is globalization. Now, you may hear this word in your day-to-day -day conversations or in political discourse that you've been privy to. And you may hear common catchphrases like, we should open our borders and be more opening, uh, be more accepting of people, or we should close our borders and protect ourselves. And you have to start wondering, what does all of this mean for me? What does this mean for you? Why should students in high school, such as most of you in the audience today, care about such a phenomenon? Before I answer that, I want to start by asking, what is globalization? Well, globalization is a worldwide phenomenon that is a result of massive amounts of migration in people, ideas, and cultures. And this has been possible due to technological advancements in transportation and communication in recent history. Now, first I want to start by asking, where, but first I want to start with where we're located today. Now, Statistics Canada reports that from its record low in 1901, at 13%, the foreign-born population of Canada has steadily been rising since the Industrial Revolution to its record high in 2011 at 20.6% of the population being foreign-born as of 2011. Now, why is this number significant? Why is this important? Well, with over with 20.6% of the population representing over 6 million immigrants, stories like mine are far too common. Now, my story begins with my father. And in my father's hometown of Malakwal, a small town in rural Pakistan, around 45% of those over the age of 15 are illiterate, with that number being even higher for females. Now, that is a large amount of people, and when you, a large number of people, sorry, and now if you look at similar statistics for Canada, that number is closer to 1%, and it starts to make sense why somebody would want to migrate away, and that's what subsequently ended up happening with my family. Now, my father was the only one out of six brothers and sisters to complete a high school education and subsequently filed for an H-1B visa, and after a successful application, we immigrated to the United States of America. And you might be thinking, the US, land of opportunity, problem solved, right? But no, that's where you'd be wrong, because that's where a series of problems arises. That first problem is global. When you have the most driven members of the society leaving to find education and employment abroad, what you begin to see is large geographical disparities in wealth. And what this causes is a negative feedback loop in which the rich and richer countries get richer and the poor and poor countries become poorer. So, uh, and that, and however, even those who have the opportunity to go abroad face problems as well. And this is a perfect example of what happened with my family, in which after obtaining the H-1B visa, we were required to move from five different states in six years, because one of the restrictions of this visa is that if you were unemployed for 30 consequence of, uh, consequence of consecutive days, uh, you face deportation. Uh, and this is an extremely large amount of uh, stress to live with. And even after the six-year term limit of that visa expires, there's no guarantee that you'll be allowed to remain in the country that you migrated to. As for that to happen, your employer will have to sponsor you for permanent residency. And if that's un unsuccessful, or if you're unable to maintain that sponsorship by maintaining employment with that company, uh, you face deportation as well. And, and he, for, so for even for uh, people who successfully migrated, this becomes an issue. And after reflecting on all this information, what you begin to see is that 
globalization isn't really becoming the solution to all the problems that we once thought it would, where you have people scouring the world in search of a better life, with the freedom to break barriers and cross borders, and you don't see that happening. So what you actually end up seeing are programs like the Seasonal Agriculture Workers Program, right here in Ontario, where we're all located. And what this program entails is a large number of migrants are permitted into Ontario for a period of less than 12 months. Uh, and they are made to work for minimum wage for up to 14 hours a day uh, in grueling physical labor. And the reason they're brought in is that Ontarians and, Can and Canadians would not do this type of work for that pay rate. And they do this because if they don't, or if they complain or report these issues, what happens is that there's not much recourse. Uh, there's not much in terms of uh, a process in which migrant workers can seek uh, recourse. And this is because uh, if their employment is terminated, they have to immediately go back home. And before they arrive in Ontario, they are asked to put up a sum of money for administration costs and for transportation costs associated with migrating. And this builds up a seemingly unsurmountable size of debt for people from low socioeconomic backgrounds, such as many of these migrant workers. And that makes them more susceptible to employer uh, abuse. Now, uh, now we have to start. Uh, now we have to start thinking: How can we fix this problem? And it be, it starts with uh, and it starts with uh, specific problems like the H one B visa or the Seasonal Agriculture Workers Program. And we can start by urging our politicians and our governments that. While these people may not be born within your borders, they still are, you are still benefiting from them. And this should be taken care of, and they should be taken care of. And we need to start urging people to take care of the people they benefit from. And another thing is we, we can focus by empowering local entrepreneurs in rural communities. Following the example of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, started by Mohammed Yunus, um, this is, what they do is they offer small amounts uh, of capital for local entrepreneurs in groups. And these entrepreneurs are then able to uh, empower themselves and invest in themselves and their communities. And this raises the standard of living for those in the developing world. And you begin to see uh, improvements in the quality of life, life expectancy, and literacy rates improving with more people uh, not having to work and being able to uh, attend schools with the availability of technology that makes it easier and less labor-intensive. And these are successful stories that I've set as a goal to mimic uh, for myself in the future studying commerce. And we begin to see massive improvements in this uh, area. And once we start seeing these improvements, we begin to realize that Globalization is the beginning of what could be the most prosperous time in human history. And globalization isn't going anywhere soon. So let's not sit idly by and watch this opportunity split up this, uh, slip away. A flight from London to New York now takes eight hours. This is a journey that took early settlers of North America over six weeks. So as we've achieved 126 times reduction in travel time, I assure you that this opportunity will allow us to achieve so much more. So let's start by empowering local entrepreneurs in the developing world and making a difference. Thank you for listening.